All right. Well, thank you for coming back this afternoon to our session. My name is Andrew Chrisley from Michigan State University, and I'll be hosting this first session. Uh, our first speaker in this session is Corey Howe. He's going to talk about a semi-implicit low-rank DG method for kinetic uh, solutions of radiation and radiation emission and absorption. With that, I'm going to let Corey go ahead and tell us about what he's been doing. And I'll give you uh, sort of a I'll let you go for 20 minutes, and I'll give you a, uh, we'll do five minutes of questions after this. So, okay. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks for the invitation to speak. So um, I'm going to talk about kinetic equations, and luckily I don't have to go over a lot of the details that, um, that Jingmei did for us. And I'm going to solve what looks like a much simpler problem than she had. Um, so I should start with my collaborators. One of these is uh, Stefan Schnacki. He's there. Uh, he's part of the Sparse Institute, um, and this is supported by um, Department of Energy Applied Math Program and ECP, and I'm a part of the uh, the CharmNet Mimic Center. So I am interested in modeling uh, neutrino simulations in supernova. So, um, so this is a key mechanism for the exchange of energy between matter and, and a supernova explosion, and Essentially what happens is neutrino are released by the matter and absorbed by the matter. And I'm gonna describe this with a very simple kinetic model. It is essentially a parameterized ODE. So at the time derivative of this function F uh, is equal to an emissivity. So that's the neutrinos that leave the matter. And then I have a loss that depends linearly on F and is proportional to what's called the opacity and these are the neutrinos that are absorbed by uh, the surrounding material. So um, this is expressed in a spherical coordinate system, which I've written out here. So E is the, if, if you think of this as a, a velocity vector in three space, then, then epsilon here is the energy. It's the magnitude, essentially. Theta is the angle with respect to a preferred direction, which I uh, call Z. And then phi is ignored, actually. F, so it's, F is assumed to be symmetric around this angle phi. And the variable mu here is just the cosine of, of theta. So what does F do? So F gives the, the distribution, the kinetic distribution of, which is the density of particles at some time t with respect to this measure dE d mu. And so the way I've written this, there's no scattering, there's no advection in the phase space. And so this is a much simpler model than um, we saw from Jingmei. In fact, this is essentially a parameterized ODE. Okay, so I'm interested in using discontinuous Galerican methods for, for this discretization. So I'm gonna take the, the space um, omega, which is essentially this variable mu, tensor product with this, this variable or this domain in, in epsilon. And I'm going to approximate F on that space with the function FH. H is the, the dimension of the mesh. And so I simply write it out as a sum of, of variables in mu and epsilon with coefficients capital Fij. And I can write it in this um, matrix product form. And then this capital F is just a matrix and these basis functions are just basically piecewise polynomials sitting on the mesh. And so this is gonna be a matrix problem, not a tensor problem. So we're interested in eventually in tensors, but we're doing some analysis of some basic structural properties. Um, and so we're gonna start with the matrix formulation. So if I do the, the Galerican approximation, I won't go through the details. What you get is um, a matrix ODE for F, this function G is a matrix valued affine function. And this matrix A is a symmetric positive definite matrix, A1. You're gonna see it all over the place. I wouldn't let it confuse you. It simply comes from the weight associated with um, E squared when you do integration in the polar coordinate system. That's all it is. So we're interested in long time behavior. The reason why is that this emission absorption process is much, much faster uh, than what happens in invection and phase space. And so uh, typically you need to go to long time scales with respect to these dynamics. So we're gonna look at implicit schemes and the simplest prototype of that is the backward Euler method. So for some time step delta T, um, I have an approximate difference here and I'm gonna evaluate G 
at f at the next time step. So that's pretty straightforward. So here's a basic convergence result. So if, if you are or know a finite element person, either you can or your friend can derive this for you in probably five to 10 minutes. So it's a pretty standard result. Um, what it tells you is that this discretization that I just showed you for capital F and plus one leads to a continuum solution through this matrix product. And that solution F sub H is L2 stable in the following sense. So again, the energy, this E or epsilon that you see that appears here, this is just the weight that comes with the coordinate system. So I'm basically saying that I'm bounded by something times the initial data plus something else times uh, this emission from a material. And C is a constant that's less than one. So this N here, as you keep applying it, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so as N gets smaller, this contribution goes to zero. This is the the non-zero contribution at that point. And what you would like to know is what happens there. And what you can show is that the distance between this approximation and the discrete equilibrium is geometrically decreasing according to this formula. So this is what you start with and this is what you end up at that time step. So the reason that this is important is if you take long time steps, you may not have order of accuracy to depend on uh, in terms of knowing what the accuracy of your solution is and so you need something to tie to. So you know you expect convergence to equilibrium and that's the thing that you would like to have if you wanna have some sort of accuracy at long time. So this is a critical property. This is, a, this is one of the structural properties that Jing may referred to in her talk. Okay, so Jing may also talked about two types of um, low rank approximations that people in the kinetic theory community have been using. I'm gonna talk about uh, dynamical low rank um, there's pluses and minuses to this and what Jingmei uses, but I won't get into the details of that. Um, so if I have an M by N matrix, this is my matrix capital F that I'm thinking of. I'm going to look at the manifold of rank R matrices in that, uh, in that space, and I'm going to define the tangent uh, of the manifold at a matrix M uh, by T M M sub R. And so the dynamical low rank approximation of the ODE for F is the solution F hat, which satisfies this condition. And basically what it says is that I want to find the, um, the element of the tangent space that minimizes uh, the residual in the ODE. And again, this, this A1 is just a weight. So if I could solve this, this exactly, then I would solve the ODE. Um, but I can't, so I look for the minimum inside this tangent space. So associated this is a DG solution. I'll use hat for these low rank approximations, and it just comes from taking this inner product again. Um, and if I rearrange the factors, if I use the factorization of F as U, S, E, then I can write uh, the solution in this way. So this bracket is essentially taking the original basis functions you started with and it's combining them in a very special way so that's uh, adapted to the solution structure. And that's in the variable mu. And the same thing happens here in the variable epsilon and S tells you how to combine them. U and E are time dependent. So the basis change in time. That's what gives you the power of this, this method. The equilibrium, which I showed you before, can be written in terms of this factorization uh, where S is, a, is just a scalar. So this is a rank one expansion. Okay. So there are equivalent definitions for this. Like how do you actually implement this? So you can write an ODE for U, S, and E, um, but this is typically highly conditioned and not used, or highly ill conditioned, excuse me. Um, another thing that you can do, which is what we're gonna look at here, this is a trick that we didn't come up with, is I look at these products U times S, K is U times S, L is E times S, and you can show that K, L, S satisfy a coupled ODE system that looks like this. So the right-hand side of this isn't all that important. The thing to notice is that, um, is that it's linear in each one of these, uh, the variables where the time derivative is, but in uh, overall, it's a nonlinear system. Oops. So something keeps, oops, 
How do I get that back? I would recommend they use that mouse and keyboard to touch it. Ah, okay. So let me move this guy away. <laughs> All right, so what's getting covered up is this this challenge. So how do I evaluate this nonlinear system uh, implicitly? So we've actually tried to do this, to do a fully implicit backward Euler method. It's a nonlinear system and it doesn't always, it appears, I should say, that it doesn't always have a unique solution. So what is the strategy? So this one strategy was developed by a group in Europe. It's, they call it the bug integrator now, which stands for basis update and Galerican integrator. So the idea is that if you were given um, this U, S, and E, this thing is too slow, it doesn't respond. So if you were given U, S, and E and a delta T, it's gonna output that factorization at the next level. And essentially what it does is it does an update for K that's implicit just in the K terms, it's explicit in the other terms. Um, and then to get back U at N plus one, you do a QR factorization. Um, L is can be solved in parallel in the same way. So you only do this implicitly in L. You can do a QR factorization to get back E N plus one. And then the final step is what's this S step. So these are the coefficients. Once you have a new basis, you project your information into the your initial data into the new basis, and then you solve uh, an implicit update um, for your new coefficients. So that's the that's the strategy. So the question here is, does this work? Do I get back to the equilibrium? I mean, we have this nice equilibrium convergence property, and that's what we would like to show. So that's the basic question. So here are the things that you can do. Um, so you can show stability. So the semi-implicit DG uh, dynamic low rank algorithm is stable in the following sense. This is exactly the same result that we had before for the, the regular DG. So this is, this is nice. This is not too hard to show. Then we can show a one-step estimate. So what I have to do is I have to start with some constants. So I'll call them beta and alpha that are positive constants. And they're defined so that these two quantities in norm are essentially bounded away from zero. So what is this stuff? So this P is a projector. So given U, which is a, a, a set of vectors at a given time step, uh, this, pro this projects you onto the, the span of the vectors in U. And so what this is essentially saying, if you have this lower bound, it basically says that your current state can see the equilibrium. If you were orthogonal, then this would be zero and there's no way that your current state would know where the equilibrium was. Um, this thing being bounded away from zero is essentially the same thing. Um, it's harder to see that it's a projection. Uh, this chi comes from the weight that you have in the opacity and there's an A1 weight due to the energy. Um, but in the appropriate norms, this is essentially saying that in the energy variables, your current, your current space that you're looking at can see some component of the equilibrium. And so that's really the key in order to get this to work. So under that condition, um, I can do a one-step estimate. So if I have some distance of my equilibrium at time n, then I can get a bound with a constant at n plus one. And so in this formula, C is less than one and delta, can, delta chi can be chosen arbitrarily small. It requires an adjustment in the time step, but it can be chosen so that the number on the right is less than one. So your distance from equilibrium for a sufficiently large time step is gonna be smaller every time you take a, 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 a semi-implicit step. So that's good. So in the, um, in normal DG, if I was, um, if I was using the, what I call the full rank, the standard discretization, then these projectors at P, P sub U and P sub E would be the same, right? Where you, we would be using the same dense full rank basis every time. Um, and so if I made this assumption to start with, I could get this assumption further on. 
So, um, but now because this basis changes, I have to do some work in order to make sure that at the next time step, these conditions are satisfied again. And what you do is you essentially show that with this bound that you can make sure that the conditions are satisfied again at the next time. So that's the hardest technical step of this work. And if you do that, then you can get to this condition that you wanted before that there's a geometric convergence um, in, in the distance from equilibrium. So this is a positive result. Okay, so uh, this is just a plot to show what happens when you do this. So the, the, this on the left and right are steps that you take with uh, at different time steps and different values of n. And we do this for several different ranks. And you can actually pre predict the decrease quite well. The solid line is the predicted line and the, the dots are basically the different rank solutions. Uh, this, uh, this table at the top basically looks at a bunch of different cases where you violate uh, these conditions, these projection conditions. You can see wherever you see zeros in these projection conditions that you violated the assumptions. And what you get is that there's no convergence in those cases. But as long as you satisfy the assumptions of the, of the theorem, you do get convergence. And so these cases, the ones here that stagnate are the ones that don't satisfy the theorem. And the ones that uh, converge are the, are the cases that do. On the right, we've essentially taken case A and we've modified it in several different ways. Essentially, you need to add rank to the system in a reasonable way so you can see the equilibrium. And if you do that, you get the convergence that you want. So like I said, this was a very simple uh, parameterized ODE system. Um, you need more collision operators if you're going to do uh, neutrino dynamics. One is you need uh, different types of scattering. One is called isoenergetic. That means the energy stays the same, but the angles change. Um, the second one, uh, so we have something for that. The second one is called energy angle scattering. That's when the energy actually changes. And neutrinos satisfy a, a blocking principle that makes this a nonlinear operator. So this is our next step. And then, of course, there's phase space convection. Uh, just quick open issues here. This was first order in time. So can I do higher order in time with this? Is there really a fully implicit solution or conditions for which that exists? How much of this extends to higher dimensions when we start doing uh, uh, tensor approximations? Um, what's the best way to tensorize this space? I haven't, I've only done a space with two variables, but in reality we want six. They don't all behave the same. And then the reason I'm here to, to, to listen to other talks is to see if there are what are the most efficient and scalable ways to implement the underlying linear algebra tools that are used? That's it. Thank you. So you need to make this delta be you need this delta to be sufficiently small to get the decay, yep. right? And I believe that the time step, the minimum time step that we can prove, not what we observe, but what we can prove is one over some power of that, but I don't know what that is. So you need a bigger time step to essentially get the relaxation that you need. Because the space that is changing, you would say it violates certain functions by the time to understand what was the minimum rank that you needed to start to do that at least. So 
I don't think it's an issue of rank. And in fact, to fix these cases, they're they're highly degenerate. And in fact, these examples where it doesn't converge are cooked. Okay. Right. You may you, you could come across them, but uh, because they're natural physical assumptions you might make. But if you were to randomly choose them, you would never violate these assumptions. And in fact, one of these cases, one of these alternatives on the right, I think it's A4, we just randomly picked some new rank. So you can check to see if you're violating and then pick something else and you should be okay. So if the rank is smaller than 16, then you have to go bigger. You have to get bigger, bigger, but probably by one. I get that assumption. So this is going to talk about optimal matrix for meta tensor algebra. And uh, I will go ahead and let her give us the story she told you about. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for the, to the organizers for pulling this great workshop and inviting me to speak. Uh, really excited to talk about this up and coming work. Uh, that's joint work with my grad student, Catherine Keegan. Uh, and this is, uh, I'm funded through the NSF and uh, Katie is a DOE fellow. Um, so uh, I wanna just preface this by saying I'm using algebra a little differently than we've heard in other talks. Um, but I hope you, this is something maybe you haven't seen as frequently. This might give you some ideas, might be able to be incorporated in your work in interesting ways. Um, I'll also say, I usually start this talk by saying, what is a tensor and why we care about it? I cut those slides for today. I think we're good. Um, but I'm going to jump into uh, thinking about how we get effective representations of multi-way data. And some words that you'll see come up and each have different decompositions associated with them is we might look for something like a compressible representation. So for those who've seen Wally, he's compressing the trash for us. And I really went with this theme for this slide. Uh, so we might be looking for something like a compressible representation, a Tucker decomposition might be good for that kind of property. Might look for interpretability using something like CP. We've seen some talks that, that cover that. You might look for something that's computationally efficient uh, you know, solving PDEs, having that format that you can implement really efficiently. I want to add one more adjective for you to consider as you build up these representations. And this is something called matrix mimeticity. The idea is that we have things we know and love about matrix algebra. Can we bring those into a higher dimension and use those to our advantage? Okay. So empirically, we've seen some advantage of this already. You see, we have some video data that we want to compress. We have a mimetic approach and a non-mimetic approach that have about the same storage costs. And in the mimetic approach, we get a pretty clean approximation. The non-mimetic approach, you see these ghosting artifacts appear. So there's some empirical advantage of using mimeticity. Um, and how are we going to get to this matrix mimeticity? Here's the path for kind of the intro of the talk. The first thing I'm going to do is think about tensors a little differently. I'm not going to think about having some data and factorizing it first. Instead, I'm going to think of tensors as operators, T linear operators in particular, and define that algebraic foundation. And from this foundation, we're going to be able to preserve matrix algebraic properties like rank and orthogonality, lots of properties that we know and love. And then from this, we're going to be able to talk about these effective representations. In our case, they're actually going to be optimal. So let's first, let's start with that first point. How do we uh, define tensors as operators? Uh, we do something called the star M product or the M product. Okay, and let's start with the picture at the bottom. If you squint and ignore the third dimension, that looks like matrix multiplication. My linear algebra students should be able to do that. Uh, and when we're talking about tensor operations, we're gonna think of tensors as matrices of tubes. So these, uh, each, these are vectors lying along the third dimension. Each entry is a tube. And how we define the multiplication of two tensors 
depends completely on how we multiply tubes. So instead of multiplying scalars, we're multiplying two tubes here. And this multiplication depends on this invertible matrix M. So once I've defined how tubes multiply, we all know how to multiply tensors, okay? So how do we multiply tubes? Uh, if I have two tubes A and B, I'm gonna multiply them using the following formula. And the easiest way to see what's going on here is to think about the action of A on B, okay? And the action of A on B is completely defined by the structure of this matrix R of M that's parameterized by the tube A, okay? Um, and you see here that, uh, you know, what, what kinds of structures can we obtain? Well, if M is the identity matrix, then the structure we get is a diagonal matrix uh, parameterized by A. So this is your traditional Hadamard pointwise product. If we use the discrete Fourier transform, you get a circular matrix with respect to A, uh, parameterized by A, and this is our T product for those familiar with that concept, okay? So we now know how to multiply tubes, we thereby know how to multiply tensors. Um, now let's get into getting optimal res representations. Uh, and the workhorse of this is always some sort of SVD. Uh, so we're gonna define this TSVDM that breaks down a tensor into a US and a V tensor that have looks, probably looks and feels a lot like a matrix SVD, okay? And in fact, we have all those properties that, that one would want. We have orthogonality of U and V. We have an ordering of the singular tubes so those red tubes there are ordered. Um, and we have a notion of rank consistent with that of matrix rank. So we have the T rank, which is the number of non-zero singular tubes. Okay, so the number of non-zero red tubes you see there. And from this decomposition, we also get an optimal representation. In particular, we have an Eckert-Young theorem that says the truncated TSVDM is the best low rank approximation, low T rank approximation. Okay. This is not something you get for free in other tensor decompositions, you get this for free, uh, or you get this in when you have mimeticity here. Okay. So now the most common question I get when I give talks about this star M product is how do you choose M, right? How, how do we choose the identity or the, or the Fourier transform or, or something like this? Um, and that's what this talk is really focused on. How are we going to choose M? And I want you to notice, uh, M is kind of playing two roles here. It's playing both kind of in this matrix, getting kind of the eigenvalues in some way, and it's your eigenbasis. So it's a really, it's quite complicated to know exactly what M is doing in there. Um, and we're gonna try to try to learn it in this talk, okay? Uh, so how are we gonna choose a good M? We're gonna solve an optimization problem. So we have some sort of objective function phi that's gonna depend on our transformation M and some desired representation X, okay? Um, and M and X are gonna have some restrictions on them. In this talk, uh, we're gonna assume our transformation M is orthogonal. Um, and depending on the objective function, we'll have different restrictions on X. So if we're looking for the best low rank approximation, then we're restricting X to be of low T rank. If we're looking for something like an extension of linear regression, something like T linear regression, uh, we might just restrict X to be of the appropriate size but there are a whole host of other problems we can capture in this framework. Um, now, the key point here that's a little hidden, but I think, think I'll convince you on the next slide, is that the representation that we get depends on this transformation. So we want to exploit this in our optimization problem. So instead of solving this full optimization problem, we're gonna solve a reduced optimization problem using variable projection or VARPRO. And what this does is we, we split our optimization into two parts. We have this inner part that finds the best representation X for a fixed M. So we're thinking of X as a function of M. And we have this outer part where we have this reduced objective function phi bar of M that's now only a function of M. So again, we've, we've, we've kind of projected out that variable X. That's why it's called variable projection. And visually you can think about optimizing over a line here. So instead of having you know, two variables, we eliminate one of them. This red line is the best given in M, what's the best choice of X? And we're just following that line down to the optimum, okay? Um, so can we do this in this framework? Well, we have an algebraic advantage. We actually have a closed form solution for this representation X. 
uh, namely X could be the truncated TSVD uh, M, or it could be maybe something like the solution to the normal equations in some sense. Okay. Um, so we know how to solve this inner optimization problem. How are we going to solve the outer one? How are we going to actually optimize M and optimize this algebra? Uh, we're going to use Riemannian optimization on the orthogonal group. So we start on some manifold. We have an initial point, the white point there. We first compute a Euclidean gradient, project onto some tangent space. That projection is uh, based on the orthogonal group here. And then we retract onto the manifold, so we're following some geodesic. Um, so this is standard Riemannian optimization. Where a lot of the work goes in is how we compute this Euclidean gradient. I'm going to sweep that under the rug for this talk. <laughs> Uh, but there's there's a lot of work that goes in there. Okay, so why do we need all this machinery? I just I just told you about VARPRO. How well does this op this star M optimization work? Uh, so what we looked at first was a a toy problem with a, a t linear regression problem where we knew the solution was zero. We could get to an optimal solution, and we compared using an alternating approach, so update X, update M, and switch or using the VARPRO approach, solve, solving that reduced optimization problem. And we see here for different sizes of problems, VARPRO does quite well, we get to that zero, but the alternating approach stagnates. So we, what this is evidence of is there is strong coupling between the representation and the transformation, and VARPRO seems to be the way to go if you wanna optimize in this way. Uh, so then we looked at uh, a, a, a compression problem, image compression problem, um, and what we have here is we have a bunch of digits. This is not MNIST. It's actually an, a MATLAB built in. Uh, these are rotated digits. And just for illustrative purposes, I'm storing these digits as frontal slices of this tensor. Um, and we're going to try to get a, a T rank one approximation to this tensor here. Okay. Uh, so the top row is the original. Uh, the next row is our learned approximation. Uh, the third row is a different data dependent approach. And the bottom row is the identity. Um, which one looks best? Ours looks best, or I, wouldn't, I couldn't put a slide together, right? <laughs> uh, so ours, ours looks quite nice. Uh, the identity looks uh, like nonsense, uh, but remember we're doing these rank one approximations. So you're getting this blocky approximation to each, each image. So this both tells us it's good to have that third dimension interact. Um, and it was worth learning this relationship if you're trying to get a, a rank one approximation. Uh, I, I am showing you the best image for M star. We do pretty well for the worst image also. So not, not hiding too much from you. Um, but the, the uh, application I'm, I'm quite excited about uh, is something a little new for me. It's not an imaging application anymore, but for reduced order modeling. So our goal is to approximate some, some uh, full dynamics in a reduced subspace. Um, and one way to do this is using a method of snapshots. Um, so what you see here is uh, we have a, a parameterized dynamical system, in this case, a wave equation. Um, and our states here are the actually the solutions to this wave equation. Our parameter is uh, different wave speeds. Okay. So what we do for building a snapshot matrix is we grab this solution for a fixed parameter, fixed wave speed, at different points in time, and we build a matrix out of that. And then we're going to turn this into a snapshot tensor by stacking those snapshot matrices as frontal slices. Okay. And what you see here uh, is that there is some difference in in the behavior because of that wave speed, but there's also a lot of commonality uh, for the different solutions. Okay. So we're hoping that if we take a low rank approximation to the snapshot tensor we can get a, a good a good basis, this U here for, for our data. Okay. Um, so let's let's see some examples of that. Uh, so uh, up top you see the true solution at different time points for a particular wave speed. Uh, in the middle again you see ours and the, the global relative error uh, to the right. And below you see if we used an identity mapping. So didn't do anything to connect that third dimension. We see a uh, much better performance by our learned M. Uh, we also looked at different heuristic approaches though. We looked at uh, this matrix C, which is the discrete cosine transform matrix. So kind of the real analog to the T product. Um, and it does a little better than the identity, but still you can miss the second time point. I think you can see it doesn't do a very good job. 
And we also looked at this data dependent approach, but it's more of a heuristic approach. And again, we see some some nice performance by uh, by M star, the learned one. Uh, perhaps this is even clearer if we look at the error here. So black means we nailed it. Blue means we underestimated and red means we overestimated. Uh, brightness means we really missed. Uh, so we can see the identity doesn't do very well. Uh, we do better with C, but still miss more often than we do with M star. Uh, and same same result for D. Transpose. Uh, so I want to make, uh, you might have think thought I just pulled this particular example out because it looks good. Uh, how did we do for every parameter? Well, here you see that this, this green line with the filled in uh, diamonds, that's our method. Uh, and we're trying to be have as small relative error as possible. And we see that for different wave speeds, we're consistently the lowest, except for maybe a few points, compared to the three other approaches we discussed. Uh, the gray line is the example I showed you before, but we're doing well kind of across the board. Um, we also looked at if we initialized with different different starting points, and you can't really see the difference. So it seems like it's pretty robust to the initialization here. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, we talked about star M optimization, how we leverage matrix mimeticity. We have some uh, flexibility with the objective function, and we can get better approximations than heuristic approaches. Uh, where are we going next is really reducing the cost of this star M optimization. We view this as an offline cost currently, you want to build a really good approximation, you're willing to pay the cost, and then it might reduce your storage in the long run. But we want to see if we can really do more here, be more efficient. Uh, we want to extend to higher order tensors. We know how to do this, but how do you do that in a cost-effective way? Um, and we also want to, uh, one, one thing Katie's working on right now is relaxing some of these algebraic constraints to get some more efficiency and, and for some practical reasons uh, as well. Uh, so thanks, uh, happy to take questions. Yeah, so that's one way to view it is that it's it's kind of rotating your data so that it becomes more linearly dependent in the, in the after you've applied M. Um, you can also view it as a way of decorrelating your data in that third along that third dimension. So what the T product does is it breaks your data into different frequency components. So you think of these as completely separate. Um, so that's another way to to think about this. But yes, but yeah, the geometric there's kind of a rotation going on. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I had a question about the M. So do you find that M is useful across, say you do image compression for or video compression, mm -hmm. do you find that you can use the same M that you learn on one set of videos on other videos, or is it more sensitive to like the specific data you're uh, uh, compressing? Yeah, so we, we did look at this for the, the image case. Um, and what you see up top is with no retraining, we're consistently the best or second best approximation compared to the heuristic approaches, um, which is, uh, you know, the identity happens to do well in the digit data because it's a very synthetic case. Um, but there's something, uh, the other data dependent approach doesn't do as well. So we're, we are learning something about the structure. Um, I think uh, this is, the digits case is not the best example. I, I would fully expect in the, reduced order modeling case, if we looked at the in, in between parameters, we would do quite well, just based on how well we did across the board here. Um, but there's a little more, that's not necessarily the right experiment for this particular data set to explore. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so the higher order star and product is usually defined in a recursive way. And you uh, you always have sort of the modes three to D, you always act on those in some way. Um, what makes Which makes this very a challenging framework to extend to higher order tensors, 
from a theory theoretical perspective you can do this but from a practical perspective i think there are some interesting ways to go about that um but yeah i think uh i i wouldn't necessarily recommend doing this with uh you know 100d tensor yet but maybe soon <laughs> Thanks. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the learning of M, uh, the optimization problem was a bottleneck. Um, can you briefly say, like, are there some key computation kernels that are kind of the bottleneck in the optimization of M? Absolutely. Uh, so, oh, actually, I love getting to use backup slides. It's great. Um, so in this reduced optimization problem, we compute a Euclidean gradient. Um, and this gradient, uh, we have to differentiate through X now because it's a function of M. Um, for regression, t-linear regression, it's kind of nice. You get to ignore that contribution. But in the lower end case, you have to compute a TSVDM. So effectively, every step, you're computing another SVD. So it's it's quite expensive. Um, again, it, if it's an offline cost, uh, which is common in reduced order modeling, you think about a pre, you, you're willing to pay the expense offline to use it later, um, then this might be doable. If we want to really scale this up, uh, we have to think about how do we get more efficient with this and in general with star m product so thanks yeah uh thanks for the talk is there any relationship between the star uh, whatever this decomposition is called and the other traditional decomposition and maybe the m say for a simple case say we have an a tensor which can be orthogonally decomposed mm -hmm. via cp so is there any relationship between the two uh, there is a relationship with the, the HOSVD. Um, if we choose M, actually this data dependent, the Z transpose you kept seeing, uh, we can connect that to the HOSVD exactly um, and, get, and get some uh, show that we can theoretically, we can prove that we have a better approximation than the HOSVD. Um, and there are some connections with uh, that we can store this in a CP format, but I don't think there's as direct a connection with the decomposition. Um, so happy to chat more about it. Cool. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, we're not quite at the stage to compare yet, um, mostly because of um, how this, if, what what one would traditionally do in in uh this is closest to proper orthogonal decomposition approaches what one would traditionally do is concatenate these snapshot matrices uh as a, as extra columns of a matrix and then decompose um and because that matrix gets has more columns the we we can't com this basis can't compete with the matrix basis currently uh, the other problem is that we're we're still tied to this parameter dimension, so we have to think about okay, we have this perhaps a very expressive basis, but we have to get rid of that parameter dimension in some way. So I think this is uh, you know really interesting future work, but that's why we didn't compare to the matrix case just yet. So our next speaker is Ethan Long. He's going to talk to us about a high order QR. Uh, my my bifocal is not working here, but I got a QR iteration for scalable Tucker decomposition. Uh, QR, a high order QR iterative iteration for scalable Tucker decomposition. So <laughs> my glass way to figure out. <laughs> so that, All right. We're going to let our speaker go ahead and okay. get started. All right, thank you. All right, uh, so uh, I think it's a very fruitful day. Uh, hopefully, my talk will be helpful to you too. So uh, I'm gonna talk about a very basic problem, uh, Tucker decomposition, and then propose a new algorithm. Hopefully, uh, uh, more people will be able to uh, find it interesting. Okay, so I'm sure most of you know about the Tucker decomposition. It's one of the many tensor factorization models that people use. Um, so for Tucker decomposition, uh, yeah. So basically uh, the idea is that we're going to find a sm perhaps smaller 
uh, tensor of the same uh, uh, dimensions, uh, not dim number of modes, right? And then for each of the dimensions, we're gonna find a uh, a factor matrix so that you know the the whole uh, bigger tensor is synthesized. Um, so of course, in in most real cases, uh, you're not dealing with a, a, a tensor that is exactly uh, decomposable into this one. So we're trying to find the low rank approximation. And so we're gonna focus on this low multilinear rank approximation formulation for that, right? So a um, couple of things about this factorization, right? So perhaps the, the, the other most widely used factorization is the uh, polyadic decomposition. And the biggest difference is that in most cases, low rank polyadic decomposition is essentially unique, whereas this one is not. Uh, but this perhaps also finds uh, good properties with the non-uniqueness, simply because you can always multiply a, a invertible matrix for, uh, for this factor matrix, and then you absorb the inverse of that into the core tensor, right? So with that, with that uh, what people typically reformulate the problem is to uh, without loss of generality, assume that each of the factor matrices are uh, have orthonormal columns, right? And then, you know, compare that formulation with the original one. Here we have n factor matrices as well as the core tensor, but with orthogonality, uh, orthonormal assumptions, then you can essentially eliminate the, the variable of the core tensor and just directly maximize the, the norm of the of this one with the mode products, right, along every dimension, okay? And using this formulation, perhaps the, the golden standard algorithm, right, in, in most tensor toolboxes are gonna use, uh, it's perhaps the, the, the one that you're actually applying is the higher order of orthog orthog orthogonal iteration, okay? So key steps are the following. First of all, it's kind of a block coordinate descent method, right? You're updating the first uh, factor, fixing all the others, and then going to update the second one, fixing all the others, going to the third one, etc. And then you go this uh, cyclically. Um, and then for each of the update, uh, you're going to construct this tensor. So you're going to multiply, the mo multiply uh, all the other factor matrices that are go not going to update except for the nth one, right? Construct this one, uh, matricize it. So the size is going to be I n, right? For uh, the, the ambient dimension of that mode. And then K one times K two, times you know, all the other ones, except the K nth one, right? For the other one. So this is the matricization. And then you find the K n uh, largest singular components, uh, right? And then you do this iterative. Okay, so works really well. Um, kind of basic, right? And it has been around for a long, a long time. But uh, so far, I would say uh, it's still kind of the go-to method for uh, Tucker decomposition. Um, but it's not without issues. Um, so here are a few issues that we uh, identify uh, this algorithm, and hopefully we can. Uh, address that right, with the new algorithm. The, the most important one is this, the intermediate memory explosion, right? As I said just before, you're going to construct this tensor by mode multiply uh, n minus one factor matrices. So the size of it is I n in the one dimension and then K multiply everything except the nth, nth one on the other one. But, you know, uh, here's the thing, right? You're dealing with a, Perhaps nowadays everybody is dealing with large and sparse tensors. So we're gonna use some kind of sparse data structure to store the tensor. Um, and therefore this multiplication, you can you know, exploit sparsity. But what is this why? It's still kind of a, you know, after all of these multiplications, uh, essentially it's gonna be dense, okay? But the size is there. And for some of the applications, this, this could be a very, very large and dense matrix, okay? And for HOI, right? There's no way to around it because you have to generate that and then apply the single value decomposition of that to get the next update, okay? So uh, the best we can do now is to explore sparsity and 
just not do something super naive, like for example, doing the Chronicle products, right? So, so there's the MATLAB version, and then uh, my former colleagues at Minnesota they did the a a uh, flat one according to their own uh, CS uh, compressed sparse fiber uh, data structure for for sparse tensors. Perhaps the uh, state of the art is the so-called uh, as hot scalable uh, high order Tucker decomposition um, where they, it's SVD, right? So there are ways to compute a few principal components of it without explicitly forming the matrix. So this is exactly what is done here. They're using the Anordi's methods to try to, uh, uh, you know, approximately find the principal components without explicitly forming this uh, forming this uh, Y tensor. But still there's additional memory complexities involved, okay? Um, and perhaps, you know, this is something I just was thinking at the beginning uh, when, I, when, when we were thinking about this problem is uh, this algorithm relies on S SVD. Um, and we know this is a, a mathematical decomposition, right? There are multiple ways to implement it. Some are more suitable for dense matrices. Some are more suitable for sparse matrices and the dividing line is kind of blurred. Uh, so it, can we maybe even not rely on that at all, right? To, to try to get the Tucker decomposition. So this is one of the hopes that we're trying to achieve uh, when we start this, okay? Now, another concern, um, depending on which field it come from, right? So we're gonna uh, look, look at it as a optimization problem. First of all, uh, it's MP hard. Um, so whenever you're trying to claim some kind of convergence, you're going to you know relax the definition of solving and just say maybe uh, finding a stationary point, right? Um, but even that is not, okay? So previously, all we know is that this monocolically in, improves the objective. And that's about it, right? And why is that? Because it it's looks like a, an instance of log coordinate descent, right? So you open it up, for example, uh, Briseka's nonlinear programming, find the chapter, oh, BCD converges, every limit point is stationary point. That was the claim, right? But there are some caveats. So two major things that does not apply here. First of all, in Briseka's textbook, uh, you're gonna do block coordinate descent, but then every block is subject to a convex constraint, okay? Uh, this is not the case in, um, in, in our formulation because we're assuming the matrices have orthonormal columns. That's not a convex set. And secondly, this is a really important one that I, I would say that theorem almost uh, this cannot be hold, uh, use, useful in most cases uh, is that when you look at the update of each block, and you're solving a smaller problem, again, it's an optimization problem, uh, you have to make sure that the update is the unique optimizer, okay? Something you can't, you have no control of, right? You just, you drive the BCD algorithm, each block, each solve a problem. How do you make sure that this is unique, okay? In fact, it all, uh, it's never unique in our case because it, uh, you're up trying to find some essentially a, a subspace. So one, also normal matrix, you know, any rotation also uh, works. So these makes that this thing cannot uh, do, right? So you can say the objective monotonically improves, uh, but but you cannot claim that it converges to a stationary point. A few things that people have tried, for example, okay, so now let's go back to the original um, original formulation reintroduce the core tensor and just drop the orthonormal constraint. Uh, it's still not guaranteed to converge simply because of this uniqueness requirement. That's it's hard to say, right? And in, in practice, it just doesn't really work very well compared to the orthonormal uh, formulation. Um, there's one way to fix that, which is that, you know, you have end blocks, right? So instead of do this uh, cyclically, uh, you can look at all of the N updates and pick the one that gives you the best improvement. So this is 
in a framework called maximum block improvement. If you do that, then you don't really need that uniqueness uh, assumption for each of the update to guarantee uh, stationarity convergence. Um, but it's not really very practical, right? Because you essentially increase the uh, per iteration complexity by almost n. Uh, there's some uh, claims about the vanilla HOI convergence, right? But it, it's not. Uh, it's with some additional assumptions that, uh, again, kind of not really ideal. Okay, so um, so here's our new method. Okay, um, it's extremely simple. Um, almost look identical to the uh, higher order orthogonal iteration, okay? Uh, in except for two things. One thing is that instead of calculating a Y tensor, you're going to compute a matrix that is of the same size of the factor matrix. And then using that, you're just going to find some arbitrary orthonormal basis of that, okay? So, so importance, number one, and you calculate this instead of the Y matrix, okay? So here, this is just that Y. So mathematically, this matrix is the same Y, but then you're going to multiply the nth mode uh, of the core tensor transposed. So then the size is I N by K N, okay? Um, and then, you know, any orthonormal basis of that matrix works, uh, I would say QR, Method, uh, QR factorization is perhaps the, the most efficient one to find one orthonormal basis. Okay, and then uh, for that uh, new operation, which is going to be uh, the one that saves the memory, uh, save the memory explosion, right? We call this TTMCTC. So there's already the operation called tensor times matrix chain, right? Where you calculate the Y uh, tensor but then we're going to furthermore calculate the core. And of course, we're gonna do this without uh, allocating additionally, you know, a huge, huge amount of memory. And this of course can be done. For example, you could do this element wise. So first you calculate the core tensor and then using that, this is just matrix multiplication, right? But if but Y is obtained from the TTMC, we're gonna do that element wise without uh, additional memory requirement uh, going from one, one to I N K to it. So element wise gonna calculate this, okay? So with a certain computational complexity, and that's it. So this is the main idea, right? Why are we doing this instead of the op operation that, that is using HOI is that Y N takes a huge amount of memory, additional memory. And so we're going to do this instead. And this uh, requires no more, uh, no additional memory, right? It's just the same matrix of the same size of uh, QN. Okay, uh, there's a slightly different uh, implementation. Um, I guess most of you uses MATLAB and knows that uh, one of the main drawbacks of MATLAB is that, you know, the same operation, if you write a for loop, extremely slow, but if, if you can somehow use matrix uh, vector multiplication, that's uh, much, much more efficient, right? So this is kind of the motivation to have a slightly different uh, implementation for that. So uh, the idea is this, okay? So it's empty, uh, so YN times the core transposed, uh, but then core, you can also do this with another YN times U. So Basically, the previous one, you're just multiplying these two first and then do the, these two, okay? But of course, you can do these two. Now, um, basically, the idea is that this, you have this times that, but then uh, consider this uh, matrix multiplication as a summation of uh, vector order products and do this uh, iteratively, okay? Again, no additional memory required, okay? Just computation complexity is slightly different because really because you know uh, complexity is different whether you multiply the first two matrices first or the last two matrices first. Uh, in practice, it doesn't really uh, make a huge difference. What really matters is the computational 
platforms we're using, right? In MATLAB, we try to avoid for loops. This works better. In C, okay. In C, um, um, for loops is just as efficient, so you can do this, okay? And in fact, here, you're going to traverse the data tensor just, just once. So in fact, this is probably um, recommended in, in, in C or C++. Okay, so so here's the a kind of a comparison with the per iteration complexity. Of course, things are different, right? We're, we're using a new algorithm. This is not no longer HOOI, uh, but it's still interesting to compare the per iteration complexity in terms of memory, this is minimal, in terms of computation. Now, it, look, if you look at the number, it's not huge, right? But there's a big difference is that e in each of these ones, where this IKN, this is the complexity of singular value decomposition, okay? And this is really like, in principle, you're calculating the K largest components of a matrix I by K to raise to N minus one. So of course, you know, uh, in principle, this just times K, but really when you're just cal calculating the first K uh, components, this is this is with a much larger uh, constant compared to just a matrix uh, multiplication. Okay, so there's a big difference between this IKN and this IKN. Okay, so let me first show you some experiment just to convince you that this is an algorithm that works, and uh, I don't think I have much time to go over the convergence proofs. So I, at the end, I'll just show you the the result. So. I compared it, we compared it with uh, uh, with other algorithms in, on different platforms, okay? So there's the TensorLab uh, toolbox, okay, developed by uh, even Devathawa from, uh, from Belgium, right? So, um, and he included several algorithms. So on top of HOI, he also has some nonlinear least squares or uh, some other optimization-based algorithms to compute the uh, Tucker decomposition. Uh, the main thing is that for something like these two, optimization based, they're actually dropping the orthogonality constraint. So it doesn't make sense to compare with the objective that we define. So we're just going back to the fitting error and see how it performs. Now, the HOI implementation in TensorLab does not support sparse tensor at all. So the first, you can make it an input, but the first, their first step it does is to convert it to a dense tensor. So there's really no comparison, right? You see that here, we're just zooming out this part and our method very quickly gets uh, converges, but this HOI is still pretty, in every iteration takes a much longer time, right? Not to mention other uh, optimization. In fact, they're using second order uh, optimization methods to do that. So not really suitable for large scale and sparse tensors. Perhaps the better one uh, in this case is Tensor Toolbox. Uh, the, it does support uh, sparse tensors as inputs and using their own uh, sparse uh, data structure, right? Um, so again, algorithms are different. So per iteration, uh, HOQRI uh, makes smaller improvement compared to HOI, right? But uh, with the benefit that each iteration is much faster, right? So we very quickly get to something that's almost as good right, compared to that. Now, uh, it, this is the same tensor, but this is what I'm thinking, right? Um, for this MP hard problems, of course, if you can afford to run this multiple times, you're gonna try different initialization, just pick the one that gives you the, the, the best uh, result. Okay, so that's why I didn't bother to use the same initialization. Just do multiple random initializations um, and see what it goes. So you see, obviously, because this is non-convex, you know, it doesn't converge to the same thing. So in this case, in particular, in, it does seem that HOI gives you the best result. Okay, but the caveat I think is that because of the uh, efficiency of HOQRI, you can afford to run this more times and perhaps in some other cases, you're gonna get something higher. Okay, and finally, there's a C++ implementation. And for this one, there's the only competitor we, we can find now is as hot. Uh, that's a Arnoldi implementation of HOI for single variety composition. 
and uh, you see again for much faster. And again, for this one, I'm not claiming that HQRI is better. It's just uh, for some lucky in initialization, you get a better performance there like this. Okay, uh, another much bigger uh, large tensor. Uh, same same observation. Okay, and if you compare the per iteration complexity and just really push things to the boundary, right? Um, when you just don't use sparsity at all, HOI just, uh, this is tensor, uh, tensor lab, right? It just fails. Tensor toolbox, second. Um, each of, uh, compared to S hot, uh, each of them can still work, but uh, per iteration complexity makes a, a huge difference. And, you know, this means that we can afford to run more iterations and perhaps uh, you know, get a better result uh, faster. Okay, so I um, guess we can have five, two minutes or something. Okay, yeah, I'll just uh, very quickly go through the convergence proof. This is um, first uh, a basic result, okay? to match the known HOI result, which is that iteratively, you're gonna get uh, better, uh, improve the objective, okay? This is not entirely clear. Uh, you know, for HOI, uh, you're basically solving uh, the optimal uh, factor in each iteration. So that was clear for, in that case. In this case, uh, what we can show is that it's, it's equivalent to maximizing a lower bound, a linear lower bound. And for that, you also get the monotonic increase of the objectives, okay? So that's pretty simple, there is that. So uh, what we really want to show is some kind of uh, stationary uh, con um, convergence. Uh, and to do that, we're actually introducing uh, optimization, uh, manifold optimization into this problem, okay? So because of the normal matrix with orthonormal columns is the steeple manifold. So it's a manifold, okay? And thankfully we just have a, a very basic introduction on manifold optimization. So hopefully this will be easier. So I'm, I'm using the simple case, right? Consider the so-called embedded sub manifold of linear spaces. That's essentially a bunch of equality constraints. And this makes a manifold as long as the rank of the Jacobian here is always fixed, then that's a valid manifold. And then we can have the tangent space and the projection to the tangent space. Um, well, that gives the definition of Riemannian uh, gradient, which is just projecting the regular grad gradient down to the, to the tangent space, okay? And optimality condition. So here's the thing, right? We're, we're introducing manifold optimization just to check the optimality condition. The algorithm is fixed and it's it's not a traditional manifold optimization algorithm, but we're using this optimality conditions to check uh, optimality, okay? Um, so in our case, uh, this is the objective and the manifold is the steeple manifold. So the gradient, um, the Riemannian gradient is this. And of course, to check if it's zero, we're gonna check the norm of it. And this is the formula for the norm of it. And uh, the claim eventually is that HOQRI, right, our method, always converges to a cell station point. So the, the sequence, right? The distance between the sequence and the set of station point goes to zero, okay? And no additional constraint, right? It's just always work. You don't have any uh, non-degeneracy or anything, right? Um, and the key inequality, right? Previously, we just showed that this monotonic increases. But uh, what's interesting and what makes it different from other BCD methods is that uh, instead of making it bigger than equal to zero, you can actually bound by the, the partial gradients, okay? So this is kind of the, the importance and what's special about applying BCD in this, in this method, okay? Uh, and very interestingly, byproduct. So this is something that people have not done by using manifold optimization for Tucker decomposition, right? And we applied this and, and found out that HOQRI converges, but also if you go back to HOI, it also converges, right? This is, again, a new result that people does not know. Okay, and that's, that's it for my talk.
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the, this is no, this is this is one step. This is uh, this slide here is this uh, this this step. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. So it's about efficient fine tuning of pre trained machine learning models using using tensor train. So we have learned about a lot of scientific uh, problems using tensor methods, how to compress uh, like a data multimedia using tensor, like what's the better structure of uh, tensor factorization. But what I'm going to talk about next is uh, totally orthogonal to sessions about. It's about how I'm gonna let you know, uh, teach you how to build your own personalized large foundation, large language model or stable diffusion uh, using your own computer in an efficient way. The, the magic behind it is the tensor train or other tensor decomposition format. So I'm gonna motivate uh, is, uh, how, why we want the parameter efficient fine tuning of large language of large mo uh, machine learning models. So in the last, just maybe one or two years, uh, foundation models has received uh, much attention. Such as language model, I bet most of you have used the uh, ChatGPT, and uh, because they demonstrate the power of pre-training on diverse data, because they are training on like a like a uh, well, online data, text data, textbook, but they can answer good, awesome QA questions, text of complete tabular definition. Uh, this is all done by uh, pre-training on diverse data. But the question here is like how to adapt these models to a specific downstream domain or tasks. So we need to adapt, we need to retrain it or fine tune it. So to tailor these pre-trained models for specific applications, fine tuning it is the easiest way to go. So denote the model parameter as a W here. The fine tune model just be updated the model so that it can have better performance on downstream tasks. Uh, here, the updated model we denoted as delta W. We would like to learn this delta W. But however, due to uh, the massive parameter size of the foundation models nowadays, usually it's at least a 10 billion parameter size. So traditional fine tuning can be extremely uh, expensive and uh, in environment uh, unfriendly. So becoming and Fine tuning such models is even infeasible for large research groups in universities. Uh, I don't think, uh, like, at least uh, my current university allows us to full fine tuning a large language model. Uh, so, what we can do? Uh, so, I'm going to introduce the low rank adaptation first. So, on the left figure, uh, the the upper one, the A is linear problem. It's the most efficient and naive way to do uh, fine tuning a pre-trained model. Just yeah, A, uh, you can if you can see the blue dash, uh, it's, it means we only need to train a slight of uh, a very small small amount of parameters uh, for downstream tests. It's the uh, easiest way. And the in the subplot B, full fine tuning, uh, we, we know like uh, we need to full fine tune and uh, calculate the gradients for all parameters, which is feasible. Which one is better? Uh, the answer is neither of them. Linear problem is efficient, but the limit in the per performance. It only learns a small portion of parameter, not the whole model. It doesn't update the knowledge. Full fine tuning, as I just mentioned, is too expensive. Uh, 
none of us except the big companies can afford it. So researchers nowadays develop the uh, are all doing parameter efficient fine tuning. The ultimate goal of PEFT uh, is to find the middle place between linear probing and uh, uh, full fine tuning. It aims to achieve efficient fine tuning with using only a small fraction of the parameter, learnable parameters, but yet uh, achieve comparable performance with full fine tuning. So one related work and the most popular work is called uh, LoRa. Uh, I'm not sure if you have listened about it, but I will introduce it really quick. Uh, for full time for fine fine tuning, not the efficient one, full fine tuning. The model is initialized to pre-train the weights at five zero. That's it's fixed right now. And for full fine tuning, it's just to find the delta five that is uh, like an increment of the original weights. Uh, that it can be repeatedly learned by repeatedly applying gradient descent, add them any optimizer uh, you would like to use uh, according to a previous defined uh, learning objective. Like for language model, it can be autoregressive loss function. Uh, so this is uh, like how we do full fine tuning on a pre-trained model. Let's say, let's say the increment, the size of the increments of the weights, it equals to the original model weights. Let's say if we have a GDP T3, the parameter size is 175 billion, sorry, and deploying any independent instance for uh, this function model for this expensive. Let's say we would like to uh, adapt it to a weather forecasting task, we need to fine tune it. And we, if we would like to fine tune it for like a ECG or EKG uh, classification, we need to fine tune it again. So it's inefficient. So Laura instead trying to parameter, reparameterize this increment delta phi uh, by using a small size set, uh, using a, like a, a matrix decomposition. And this reparameterized uh, form of a delta phi. Uh, it has a much, much smaller size than the original weights. So the task of efficient fine tuning is to find uh, reparameterized of their supply that is not optimizing over the original weights. And this is the mathematical essence of the LoRa. So first, uh, given we denote the pre-trained weight as uh, W0, uh, given some event dimension. LoRa constraint is updated by representing the increments like delta W uh, by a matrix decomposition B times A here, where B and A has a much smaller dimension than the original delta W. This will be detailed. During training, uh, W0, the original model weights is frozen and it does not receive any gradient update, which is deficient, while we only do an update A and B here. So to produce the final results, when we do inference, we only need to do uh, multiple, multiply A and B back and do the inference, which is quite efficient. Uh, and the ACS also has some nice, uh, like favorable uh, features because it can be plugged in. Let's say we can store A and B and we can reuse them at any time we want to reuse them. It doesn't need to be stored uh, separately together with the original weight. We can set, store them separately. And the one key difference, before I go to the next slide, is to uh, make a key notion, a key difference, like of matrix, you know, matrix decomposition or tensor decomposition with matrix compression. Uh, like the previous talk, we have listened about uh, how to do, do low rank op approximation, how to compress data. Uh, we need to some, find some AOS goal or uh, CP decomposition to find the best factor matrices. But instead, in low, low rank adaptation, we are not fitting any original data. We are just utilize the tensor decomposition format to parameterize the increment of weights. And we learn them uh, use uh, some uh, machine learning objective loss function, not the uh, residual function. So that's a key difference. We are just utilize the, utilizing the tensor tree uh, format, not the, the tensor tree decomposition. So in summary, LoRa has several uh, very uh, favorable features.
features like it makes fine tuning efficiently uh, by dramatically uh, reducing the number of trainable parameters. Everyone can do that right now. And uh, since we, the original pre trained weights are kept frozen, that means you can have multiple lightweights and the portable LoRa matrix that you can uh, use for various downstream tests. And it, it can be shown that we can like uh, do a linear combination of these multiple portable LoRa models for better performance. And uh, it has been demonstrated that the performance of model fine tuning using LoRa has comparable performance with full fine tuning, which is uh, like our the ultimate goal of full parameter efficient fine tuning. However, there are some limitations of these methods. First of all, the LoRa only adapts the attention weights. We know for large language <laughs> model or foundation models, the most important uh, module in them is the self-attention mechanism. But LoRa only fine tunes the self-attention weights, not the MLP weights. The MLP weights also plays a very important role uh, in uh, machine learning task because it uh, uh, usually serve as a uh, uh, prediction task, uh, proje projection head for downstream task. LoRa doesn't update this end, uh, at all. And uh, LoRa decomposed the full weight matrix, even some of them is not necessary for downstream task. What I mean here is uh, uh, when we try to reparameterize the delta phi, the increment, how we, the amount of how we uh, update the model uh, weights, is the same, but we have, let's say we have 100 billion parameters. Is every them very important for downstream tests? Not necessary. Can we just use some of them? So, so what I'm going to introduce is to, uh, to address these uh, two issues by uh, tensorizing these model weights and using tensor chain uh, for decomposition format. So first, we are able to find a low rank uh, representation of the pre-trained weights, including MLP, not just self-attention weights, by constructing the pre-trained weights into a 3D tensor. And how to do that? Let's first take a look at the transformer architecture. You know, there are three important uh, uh, ways. Uh, uh, WKQV for every head, and we have the weight matrix WQ, WK, WV, and uh, the final output is then projected to uh, another matrix called uh, W output, WO. Uh, for simplicity, after reshaping, we just denote that we have a pre trained weights, weight self attention, for DK by DK uh, for each uh, layer of the uh, transformer. And the four it means just we have four matrix, right? W, K, K, V, D here. And how to incorporate the MLP and modules uh, into this? Uh, we can simply reshape MLP like two matrix W up and W weights down into similar shapes. We reshape the MLP modules. After reshaping, we have pre trained weights, uh, concatenated them together. We have uh, some uh, like a 2C DK by DK, some, just some constant number. Overall, if the number of self-attention layers, L, we can form weights of self-attention and the MLP into a 3D tensor. And the final shape should be around four plus PC, L, it means the number of self-attention layers, D by D is the uh, matrix size. And then now we can decom uh, decompose it on the reparameterize it into a tensor chain format. Since everyone is very familiar with tensor chain format, may, so I would just skip it for uh, for time, since, uh, due to the time constraint. Uh, this, this is uh, the basic uh, format of the tensor chain for each element of the tensor. So rewrite the reformulated uh, equation for pre-trained uh, weights that we just uh, introduce how to uh, construct a 3D tensor, we can have three latent uh, factors, U, V, Sigma here, that, uh, that formulate the increments of the updates of weight. And uh, for simplicity, let's, take, let, let's now uh, analysis the complexity here. For simplicity, let's denote the rank of the tensor chain 
uh, are equal. R equals to R1 and R equals to R2, which is much smaller than the original dimension, the weight dimension. It turns out the size of the factor, the memory requirement, is only takes about uh, VR plus VR2 uh, here. But instead, uh, for LoRa, for matrix representation, this number can be VR plus VRD. RD and RD, R2, R square and RD, this is the difference. And uh, since R is much smaller than the, the weight dimension, uh, you can see that using tensor train format, it's much, much efficient. It uh, takes uh, like a, a much smaller constant, as I will show you later. Next, I will do the experiments. Actually, this uh, low rank adaptation, whatever matrix or tensor decomposition format has real world applications. Uh, for example, large scale data sets for training a robust machine learning is not feasible or available for every hospital, or every site. Some hospitals may have limited number of samples. Uh, can they train a robust or reliable machine learning models that can be applied to patients? Not in not, but what they can do or we can do is we pre-train a model and the pro give release to them. They can fine tune it using their own data or public available data and evaluate on their own data set. That's the solution nowadays. So we evaluate uh, the this our method using public uh, training, a public available data naming suite and evaluate on another related data set, the EICO. Both are EICO data sets. So we evaluate the effectiveness of the methods in terms of efficiency, like how many numbers, learnable parameters, and the utility, like how it performs for downstream tests, classification tests. Uh, so due to the time constraint, the evaluation is sloppy. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> but from the table, we can see uh, full fine tuning uh, takes about, uh, of a pre-trained birth, takes about 1.4 billion parameters. And the LoRa takes about uh, almost 0.5 million. So we take only about half of that. And uh, in terms of the, the utility on downstream tasks, our methods also is comparable with full fine tuning and uh, uh, LoRa. So this is a, a, like another simple demonstration about the memory footprint comparison uh, regarding the scalability here. There are three different models, like a vision transformer, stable diffusion, LAMA. Full fine tuning takes about like 20 gigabytes, 27 gigabytes, or even out of memory for LAMA 7 billion. And uh, we can tell that the path to using tensor tree takes least of num amount of memory requirement when we use the rank of four. And this figure below shows the scalability. When we increase the rank, how many memory of number of parameters we need to train during fine tuning. So in conclusion, the main takeaway message is that uh, we just demonstrated, we just go through how low rank of approximations or decomposition format can be helpful uh, for the parameter efficient fine tuning of large pre-trained models. It's now now the most popular tool uh, in machine learning community. And uh, low rank approximations requires much, much less GPU requirement while maintaining several comparable performance with full fine tuning. And uh, there are many interesting future works that need to be discovered or identified. For example, we know there are many tensor decomposition. Why tensor twin? Uh, uh, Tucker, CP2, or why, why, why not others? Uh, this is based on the hypothesis, like hypothesis of general low rank of approximation methods is that the change of the weights delta W during model fine tuning has a low rank in trans intrinsic rank. That means uh, with low rank factor matrices, uh, it's, it's enough to recover the full uh, change of pre-trained models, the fine tuning. And how to theoretically justify tensor training might have the uh, suitable low rank intrinsic, low low rank in, low intrinsic rank for property is interesting. And uh, another meaningful direction is to add uh, constraints on sparsity. As I just mentioned, uh, 100 billion parameters that's not a necessary or useful for down for downstream tests. We need to select like we need to do parameter wise selection 
that is sparsely constrained. And these are some useful reference for uh, this low rank approximation uh, for pre-trained models. I would definitely recommend this scaling down to scale up guided to parameter infinite fine-tuning, which is very helpful. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, with Laura, it seemed that one advantage is that if you want to just apply it to X, you can multiply by B, then by A. But while with your tensor chain decomposition, you've kind of folded a few different layers into the tensor. So is it kind of more difficult to do inference in this format? No, that at all. So do you, do you need to kind of reconstruct all the updates or can you apply it implicitly? Yeah, we can still like reconstruct it as a original uh, model size. So. Yeah, as I mentioned, uh, sorry, the, the experiment section is sloppy right now, so. <laughs> At least for the test data, data set, it is. And yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, the NLP language test, but not yet. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, so. <laughs> Uh, so you mentioned uh, so so you you use tensor trend as a tens tensor network decomposition. So and you also mentioned at the end that also uh, other types of decomposition might work. So I'm wondering, is that possible to, like, do you think it makes sense to take into account the structure of the neural net and use a decomposition that might somehow looks like that structure, and and assuming that your updates will somehow follow that structure, and be like be presentable in that sense. So, I mean, the, so do you think that's uh like that makes sense? Fine, fine. You mean fine tuning a model will like follow a tensor? Yeah. So format. I'm basically I'm I'm assuming like your up your like fine tuning updates might have some uh structure oh, uh, followed from the structure of the neural net. So that you can design your tensor network decomposition according to the structure of the neural net to reflect that uh, analogy. So, I see. Yes, yes, it's interesting. Like in, I, if I remember correctly, there are some discovery showing there are some connections, like different initialization of uh, low rank adaptations combined together has can maintain similar. Performance. That's saying that uh, every like low rank of approximation, they have the same structure. They review. That's what they review. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.